Can we get seated so we can get started? Yeah, Lucy, I'm waiting for you. <laughs> okay, we have it. Well, if, do you want to just, do, why don't you just vote? Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Ma Bell, you want to take roll call? No. <laughs> Thanks, Janice. <laughs> For those of you who didn't hear, Janice said no. <laughs> Acadia. Present by proxy. Andover A. Present by proxy. Andover B. Present by proxy. Andover C. Present by proxy. Andover E. Absent. Andover G, absent. Andover H, present by proxy. Andover I, absent. Bedford B, absent. Oh, I forgot, Bedford A. Present by proxy. Bedford B, absent. Bedford C. Present by proxy. Bedford D. Absent. Bedford E. Present by proxy. E. Mm -hmm. He's here. Okay. Bedford E had no proxy, but they are here. Has a proxy. You got them mixed up. Okay. So Bedford F, present by proxy. Bedford, Bedford G is here, right? Yes. Okay. Bedford H, absent. Bedford J, absent. Brookfield, present by proxy. Cambridge A, present by proxy. Cambridge E, absent. Cambridge F, present by proxy. Cambridge H, present by proxy. Cambridge I, present by proxy. Cambridge K, present by proxy. Cambridge L, present by proxy. Dorchester A, present by proxy. Dorchester B, present by proxy. Dorchester D, absent. Fairfield B, absent. Fairfield E, present by proxy. Fairfield F, absent. Fairfield G, present by proxy. Fairfield H, present by proxy. Gloucester A, present by proxy. Gloucester B, present by proxy. Gloucester C, absent. Gloucester D, present by proxy. Gloucester E, present by proxy. 
Gloucester G. Absent. Gloucester H. Present by proxy. Gloucester K. Absent. Gloucester L. Present by proxy. Gloucester M. Present by proxy. Gloucester P. Present by proxy. Grantham. Highgate A, absent. Highgate B, present by proxy. Highgate E, absent. Highgate F, present by proxy. Highgate 3, present by proxy. Highgate 4, present by proxy. Idlewood, Present by proxy. Inverness. Present by proxy. Knowles 1. Present by proxy. Knowles 3. Present by proxy. Lancaster 1. Present by proxy. Lancaster 3. Present by proxy. Lancaster 4. Absent. Lynnhurst. You're present. So if you're present, I don't call you guys. You checked in. You checked in. Okay. <laughs> uh, Lynnhurst, absent. Yeah. Manchester 3. Present by proxy. Manchester 4. Present by proxy. Nantucket 2. Present by proxy. Nantucket 3. Present by proxy. Nantucket 4. Present by proxy. Nantucket 5. Absent. Oakley Green. Present by proxy. Oxford 1. Absent. Quill Pass. Present by proxy. Radisson 1. Present by proxy. Radisson 2. Present by proxy. Richmond. Present by proxy. Tremont 1. Present by proxy. Tremont 2. Present by proxy. Worlington. Present by proxy. Yorkshire. Absent. Mr. President, you have a quorum of 86.2 percent with 4,763 units with 92 association present. Thank you, Ma Bell. Uh, just so, and, and I know we're having association meetings uh, that started last month and are continuing through the beginning of March. For any of the new presidents uh, that are taking over their association, representing their association, uh, we appreciate if you would sign in uh, to let us know you're here. Uh, once you sign in, Ma Bell notes that you are present, so when she does roll call, she will not call your association because she knows you're here and it speeds up the roll call. So just. Uh, keep in mind that as we uh, progress ahead through the year, if you are in attendance, just come up to the table, tell them you're here, give them your name. Uh, they will check it against the roster which you provided to First Service, and we will mark you as present for the meeting. Uh, with that, I call the meeting to order. It is 941, and would you all rise for Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
The first item on the agenda is the approval of the December 17th, 2021 Draft Federation membership meeting. Do we have any proxies that have voted no? So all proxies have voted yes. yes. Do we have any objection from the audience of the approval of the minutes? So we do not have to go through an entire roll call. <laughs> Seeing there is no objection to the approval of the December 17th, 2021 draft minutes, we will consider them approved by unanimous consent. That moves us on to our reports and I would ask who wants to go first okay ginger <laughs> then i will turn the meeting over to ginger from vesta to go over the land trust uh re management report We'll get there. Well, somebody's got to go first, right? So good morning. Nice to see you all. We'll get started here with our fitness center usage. You want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. Hold on. There we go. Here's your December usage numbers. Um, these are actually a little low for, for uh, the holiday month. You'll start seeing these climb as we are now uh, heading into season. Um, still very respectable usage down there at the South Club. I always mention that because that was the main fitness center and, and the board at that time made the decision to keep it open because there are some folks that just want a little bit more private and quiet environment. So it's still 17% of the total visits. You can see your water class attendance. That always drops when the temperature uh, drops and uh, land group climbs. Spa and salon usage here, you can see that we have uh, just shy of $20,000 in spa, slightly lower than usual for a holiday rich month where people are getting their hair and nails done, but still very respectable traffic. I think some of this is just um, customer comfort due to COVID and still not coming out a little bit, but otherwise team's doing great over there. Here's your food and beverage usage, total patrons served over 7,700. Um, Thirteen percent of that still portico pickup, a very valuable service, probably uh, not going away uh, since we opened that and began that during COVID. Uh, sales for December, interestingly enough, almost spot on to what they were for the prior month, just a couple thousand dollars off. And then La Perk usage, you know, we've opened that up with a new grab and go concept. It's a, it's a little bit of a slower um, roll up here. You know, it's, it's a different type of environment, but they're averaging about 1100 a week. We are talking uh, to the board on a regular basis on, you know, different things we can do up there and what those uh, customers would like. I can tell you they let us know what they would like is to have Taco Tuesday back, but we'll be talking to the board and, and getting their opinions on that. Here we are in our projects, the North Court Complex Shuffleboard Courts. Uh, this project is underway. We'll be working with one set of eight courts doing the resurfacing there, and then they, the residents can still use the other courts and then swap and, and finish the other eight. Uh, just to try and uh, reduce resident impact and interruption of what, what, they, what they love to do out there. The project is estimated to take three to four weeks. Hopefully the rains will hold and we'll get that done in a timely basis. The sewer line that um, broke actually right out behind your office, Keith, um, those repairs have been completed. I think they still have some uh, dirt work to do back there. The elevator at the 2020 building, we were so uh, sorry about this. We had a, a power surge. It kind of blew out the, uh, the circuit boards. There were three of them. And the vendor had two of them, and then they had to kind of search the world and order the third one, and that's been on uh, delayed until mid-February. Any residents that are attending meetings over there and do need the elevator should be aware it won't be aware, available. We're trying, uh, and the vendor knows, as soon as that part comes in, it's, it's um, you know, the, uh, the digital um, 
the chips. And that's why you've probably read in the news, those are, I don't know who's making them or what they're made of, but they are delayed. And uh, the <laughs> I'm not gonna say that. Okay, so the tram, uh, this was ordered um, long ago and uh, I wanna say about May for the transportation department. We have a, a regular uh, program where we replace trams while their, va their uh, resale value is still high and there's not too many miles on them and the, the repair and maintenance fees aren't real high. So it's, it's a, a valuable plan. It's been in place for more than a decade and of course uh, the world is just not cooperating. So um, the rep was reported that Ford has now cut production and our order among many others were canceled. Uh, so we've now been informed the time frame may be for fall. Uh, the good news is that the tram and the uh, operations are still running, the, the taking care of people. There's no interruptions there, but uh, we did want you to know that um, you know, it had been delayed. Uh, we're moving on to uh, the South Club, the South Club pool deck expansion project uh, it, where the cabanas have been combined into, uh, we're calling it a tiki bar, it's not really a tiki bar. I think the board thought it'd be fun to kind of have a, a contest and, and name that area out there so that'll be coming at some point. But um, we call this phase one, they've broken ground out there. If you are a pool devotee, you've probably seen this work beginning. Uh, with the demolition and earthwork, uh, plumbing work also begins this week. They're having some mechanical stuff done because basically they're getting those and gonna turn them into uh, a little um, food and beverage uh, service outlet. We've also ordered the windows and doors that are belonging in there, trying to get ahead of some of those construction and supply chain delays. Um, but barring all of those things and labor shortage, and I sound like a broken record, but I, I have to keep just telling you the truth about it, that you know we're kind of at the mercy of, of a lot of the economy and, and the industry right now. Uh, we plan for a second quarter completion, um, and cross your fingers, we hope that happens. Along with this comes some deck work and landscaping, so we will begin layering some of those uh, additional projects uh, during this this first and second quarter as well. Our goal is always to try and avoid, again, interruptions to people using the pool, especially since it's gonna be spring break and, and uh, season. Uh, but we do want our, our residents to know that stuff will be going on. We'll try to keep as many areas open as possible, but there will be construction going on down there as we, we uh, seek to improve your amenities. South Club Indoor Pool Project has been completed. It's, if you haven't been in there, take a walk through. It's very fresh and uh, clean and, and lovely. It's beautiful in there now. Oops, sorry, a little too fast there. And the 25 ton HVAC unit replacement for the South Club, the unit is still functioning. Um, it is at end of life. This was a planned replacement, but the, the, there's been delays by the vendor. So a new installation date will be to be determined. So right when you walk into the clubhouse and turn right to go to Jubilee Hall, it's that room on the right uh, across from the bulletin board. So if any of that area is being under construction for the installation, it's a massive unit. They've got to take out the wall and do some things. There will be lots of signage to route you around to get where you need to go. The, the, the team's real good about uh, providing that info for you all. Um, before I get started on this, I just wanted to know, any of you that are on the eBlast system probably received this last night, but for those who don't get it, uh, they are announcing more testing for COVID in Kings Point. Um, we know how challenging it can be to obtain a, an appointment and obtain a test uh, if you need one and deliver RX Pharmacy is providing us another opportunity uh, to provide prioritize your health and safety. So there will be testing on January 24th in the South Social, the 26th in the card room, and the 28th in Waterside. And these things are all have all been um, sent out on the e-blast. And if you need any of those dates, you can call the staff. But that just went out, so I wanted, for those who don't receive that e-blast, uh, to get that information. Uh, Matthew and the team report that through yesterday we have had 622 people tested. Out of those, 82 tested positive. 
That's a 13.1% positivity rate, but it's not necessarily different people. Some people who are looking for a negative come back soon and they're getting another positivity. Um, monoclonal injections can also now be handled by the pharmacy and uh, they are working with physicians stat labs uh, on offering mobile COVID antibody testing to help you understand your own personal immune rep response to the COVID vaccine. So lots of programs uh, underway and coming forward. Just keep, keep if, if you're interested or have a need for this, uh, keep watching for your e-blast and they'll, they'll give you more information. All right, back to the special events. Winter series selling well. I, I believe uh, you've got eight sellout shows. Uh, that's just extraordinary support uh, from the community, and, and we appreciate that. I hope you all enjoy those. There's some wonderful acts coming up. Uh, we've got Jen's Open Air Market on the first Wednesdays uh, of the month. Uh, next monthly line dance will be February 6th. The next movie is James Bond, No Time to Die. Now, this one just so happens to fall on January 28th, and there's a monthly dinner at the same time. Might be a good opportunity for a movie and a dinner. And uh, we also have on the North Club pool deck uh, a DJ event on Monday, January 31st uh, from 4 to 6. If any of you would like uh, to come up here to the North Club and enjoy uh, some music and fun. And then the ever-popular garage sale lottery, February 11th uh, at 9 a.m. in the vet. That, so that's the lottery. The actual garage sale will be March 4th and 5th. And finally, the activities open house will be February 4th here in the Veterans Theater and Kings Point Clubs can go to the box office and reserve their tables. I won't read these numbers, but here's your transportation activity during December. And in security, look at those numbers climbing. Total phone calls in a month, 10,000. Passives issued over 13,000, almost 13,400, or 15,400. Um, highest call volume on Christmas Day. Not a lot of incident reports. We love this number to be down at 17. That's any calls that come out. That's extraordinary. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, just that quiet or, or what was going on, but it's always good news when, when that's not 37 calls to the gate. Um, just a couple things. We had a vehicle arrive at the gate, wanted to surprise a resident. While that is such a, a charming idea, it's not not a good idea here in this community, so, so they did contact the resident and um, the surprise visitor was a little grumpy, but they, he did get to go visit. Uh, and finally, the team is hiring. They're looking for guards. We employ a lot of residents at the front gate, especially if you're uh, a night owl and interested in that third shift. Um, if you are, have any interest in that, uh, wanna work a few hours up there, give the gate a call and they can give you more details. And thank you, that's my report. Belated Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, just some additional information for the residents and the associations. Ginger go. mentioned there's two items that have been delayed. Uh, one of them is the tram, which is a part of this year's budget. And the other one is to be determined, which is the uh, 25 ton HVAC. Uh, at next month's board meeting, Ginger will be requesting the board to take the money that's scheduled in the budget and place reserve earmarked for those uh, two specific projects because the fiscal year ends on March 31st. So if they're not done, we will assure that money is set aside and accounted for for those future projects when they get done, whether it is uh, after March or whatever time it's done. So we aren't double counting and the money you have spent or paid into it is actually used for those particular projects. And we, my, hope to, we hope to get the AC done, but if not. If not, we would, we would reserve it. And with that, I will turn the meeting over to Keith Wilkings from First Service. Uh, to do the Federation uh, report for First Service Residential. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. 
Again, this is the uh, first service residential report for uh, for January's membership meeting, and uh, we're going to be looking at the month of December. Again, a quick note, um, all the financial statements, again, continue to be put out to all the uh, boards by the 21st of each month for the succeeding month financials. Um, and a quick note, as we go through all the annual meetings, uh, as Jack mentioned, we're updating a lot of the forms, a lot of the processes, so um, we're right in the middle of that annual meeting run, so a couple places have... Uh, been conscious of the COVID with the, the COVID outbreak, so we Im implore uh, those those boards that haven't met yet, or those memberships that haven't met, to to reach out to us if they if they need to enhance any room uh, requirements, um, or, or reach out to their members to encourage more proxies. I remember last year we did a lot of proxies and had less people in the room. So if you need anything, just let us know. We'll try to work with uh, with Festus team and, and uh, make the rooms as safe as possible for those meetings. Um, our front office operations, um, again, our lobby's still open. We follow the, uh, the the land trust guidelines as well. So no visitors are required to wear masks. Uh, we, you know, obviously we'd encourage it if you're in there. Um, our, our shields are still up and we still do full cleaning. Uh, we haven't stopped doing that the entire time. We've had a couple deep cleans done in our office as well. So, uh, you know, again, we're trying to take all the precautions we can with the, with the new spike um, from COVID. A couple stats from the front office real quick. Uh, for the month of December, there was 51 uh, sales transfers completed and 45 leases. Again, those numbers are starting to uptick a lot, a lot more, especially with season coming in the leases. We took about 3,000 phone calls. We did only 300 pest control appointments. Had about 900 folks walk in the front door. We did 39 new homeowner orientations. Uh, we updated 360 emergency contacts. So again, as those annual meetings come around, uh, we, we try to get any uh, new update information. We did 58 alteration requests, only issued 12 violations, which is, which is good and low. Uh, we processed almost 300 avid invoices and drew up eight new contracts. Before you leave that page, uh, you skipped over one, and I want to let the, the residents know because it seems to be the hidden secret uh, that First Service does provide notary service. Uh, and well, just, people can walk into your there. office. And uh, I yes. know the COA also provides it, but if the COA office is closed or for some reason, or if people are in the first office and need something notarized, that you do do uh, notary services for we, them. We do. We, I mean, if there's a, yeah, a very big mortgage or something that needs to be done, it's some, something that's a little more sensitive, you know, we, we you know, might look at that a little bit differently. But, yeah, anything generally notarized, if you need it, we have... I think three or four staff members that have notaries in the office. So. And, and also, Ginger was motioning that also the business office here in the North Club does provide notary service. Nanette, yeah. Nanette does. So there, there are various locations within Kings Point that the residents have the capability of having notary service done without having to leave the community. And it's a service provided by the COA, by First Service, and by Vesta. Uh, for the residents of Kings Point, so keep that in mind. And I just noticed that you that you skipped over it, and it is something that yep. people don't realize a lot of what is available in the community. Yeah, it makes it easier than going to your bank or something. Yeah, and it is. All, and people want to know it is all free. Right. Yep. Next slide. Sorry. Um, and insurance is the next item up. Uh, we'll be renewing the policies uh, coming up in April. Um, so over the next couple months, we'll be meeting with the insurance committee, with the USI agents, uh, just going over the, the outlook and the, and the budget as it comes up. And then as we get to those renewals, we'll start, start talking a little bit more about the coverages, loss assessment, and things like that. So keep you lookout over the next couple months as we uh, approach those renewals. Trash collection. We are still in the thick of waste connection. Uh, they have about a, another week left of servicing. I think everybody's seen the new dumpsters out there uh, throughout the community and around the, uh, the land trust buildings. Um, waste Connection is still picking the trash up until August 30th, or sorry, January 30th, August. And, uh, and FCC will officially start Monday the 31st of January. So they just made an agreement to, to place all the new dumpsters. Um, I have verified we had a couple missing dumpsters surprisingly, um, but everything's been replaced, and I think everybody has their brand new dumpster. I did a dollar check the other day, and they had still had two or three that were still old dumpsters, so 
I'll be checking that again and working with that account manager. We've, we've swapped out a bunch of them that wanted some, some larger dumpsters, so we can go both ways still. So let me know and I'll work with uh, FCC to get those uh, requests uh, processed. So, But again, uh, FCC will be officially starting January 31st. I know there's been some questions. Waste Connection continues to shift days. I know they were supposed to come Wednesdays. They, they come yes, yesterday on Thursday. I, I hear they, they may have missed a few yesterday, so we're going to try to wrap them up and get them out of here and, and move on to FCC and hopefully have a, a fresh start, a better start, and a, a better product. That also entails the residential side, just as a quick note, so everybody has the residential bins. FCC will be starting the same time with your residential bin. So I believe they put a notice out to most uh, residents that pay through their county taxes about the new trash days, which has just shifted your, um, your recycling day for you. And we also put an email us out last night, just trying to reiterate some of, the, some of the issues that we see. I know Ginger's team deals a lot with it with people dropping appliances and furniture at dumpsters. Um, those dumpsters are, are utilized for the amenity services their food and beverage, as well as the individual associations that pay for those. So we're just trying to make sure everybody's aware to not dump other trash in those dumpsters. It's not a, a communal trash area. And we try to put out some information for the Waimama uh, waste facility. So there is, a, there is a place that you can take it real, real close nearby um, that takes everything on Saturdays. Um, there was a link in the email, but it's a, it seems like it's a nice facility, and they take almost everything, paint, appliances, and stuff like that. Um, they'll let you know if you bring too much, but I think everybody should be okay. And lastly, if, if any of the boards out there, if you guys have folks doing construction or see people remodeling units, make sure that we're trying to tell those folks to haul that debris off themselves and not to utilize the dumpsters anywhere in the community or even your residential bins. You know, they, they should be hauling that debris off site uh, themselves. So again, just a couple ongoing issues that are happening and uh, hopefully again with the the new waste provider, everything kind of smooths out. And uh, we'll, we'll keep sending out information on, on the trash collection days if there's anything else coming up, so keep a lookout for those. Uh, next slide. Pest control. Pest control has been slowed down, uh, obviously, with the holidays in December, so we are still inside the three-day appointment. Again, we only had about 300 for the month of December. Um, Spectrum, real quick, we'll, uh, we've been working with uh, Tom Murphy on the I guess the Spectrum TV contract. So that, that does renew in 2023. So we're about 14, 15 months out. So we're kind of going through the process of, uh, of looking at options and, and what else is out there for the community. So Tom, we've met with a couple different providers. We'll be bringing information back to the board and kind of going through that process. Um, doesn't mean anything's gonna happen switch, you know, change wise, but it's also a good just process to see what else is out there, get some pricing and also be able to negotiate uh, with Spectrum on that end. So, um, hurricane season, uh, we have our disaster symposium coming up on March 7th. Um, again, it's going to be a big event early morning. It's on a Monday, so be on the lookout as we push out um, some more information on that. And uh, we're going to have a lot of the same speakers as last year, and I look forward to providing a lot of good information again for everybody. Um, landscaping, real quick. The Committees over my right shoulder. They've got a great presentation today to kind of go over the new contract as well as the selection process. Um, and we're asking the membership to vote on that today, so I know that's a big, uh, big process coming up, and there's some changes in there. So hopefully the presentation kind of irons out uh, just some of the process on the selection as well as the highlights of the new contract. Monthly gradings are still occurring. Again, we we have Ryan Work and OLM working. Uh, Paul Woods is still here doing. The monthly inspections, um, Ryan does three weeks out of the month, and then Paul does that final week, and we still have the grading uh, on the fourth Wednesday, usually, of every month. Next inspection and grading will take place Wednesday, January 26th. Uh, work, work orders, again, for the month of December were low, uh, only 15, um, which, is, which was mainly requests again. Uh, we're going to be doing an education workshop at the end of this month, January. Uh, it's going to be in here on Friday, January 28th at 9.30. We'll be talking, I think, strictly on the palm and tree uh, trimming and contract itself. Um, and right now, speaking of palm and tree trimming, uh, we are in the, the uh, January maintenance cycle right now, the, the weekly maintenance. They, they are uh, wrapping up today, but they will be in here 
at least two or three more days next week, just with the winds and stuff earlier this week. Uh, we kind of had them shifted around. So we try to set on a general uh, schedule for them where they're going to be at, but we do move them around as stuff happens. Um, so keep a lookout. They're still here for a few more days next week. Um, again, any issues, please let me know directly. Work orders, again, for December on the, on the palms alone on the maintenance schedule. You know, we process 380. That is, a, that is a, a portion from the POCs putting items in, as well as Ryan driving through the community, working up a list for Browns to work off of. Um, we know personally they touch about 1,000 trees in, in December. So they're, they're going through and touching a lot of trees. And I know um, with the presentation later this month, we're going to try to explain a little bit more about the contract, about the monthly maintenance cycle, what the full pruning is that occurs in April, and uh, hopefully get some more information out there to everybody just to help understand the, the, the new program that's in place. I know Liz has a presentation today about uh, the palm fertilization, um, which we're, we're asking the membership to approve as well. Uh, the, the spring mulch will be, will be coming, so toward the end of February, we'll be reaching out to the uh, associations that selected the spring mulch to just work with them and getting that delivered. And lastly, just a couple of key reminders there. Um, after hours emergency, um, again, just that number is always there for you guys. Call it when you need it. Um, a key point I want to make, uh, just a note, is the water shutoffs. We had a couple yesterday. We've had a lot more recently. Um, the county has to come out and shut off the potable water system. So if you happen to have a break in your association, either with a tree root, uh, you know, uh, um, something backed up in the lines and it's causing an issue, and they have to come out and shut off the water, you know, that we have to. There's a specific process that the the county requires us to follow. So again, I, I have to call in the actual after hours shut off for an emergency shut off. They need the plumber on site here. So a lot of the folks that I've dealt with understand kind of you have to have the plumber here, investigate what's going on, and then the county will come shut it off. And uh, the, the meetings I've been into, some people have been concerned about when the shut offs take place. Um, the after hour emergency ones will happen when they happen. The scheduled ones, we try to notify that association that has scheduled a, you know, a shutoff replacement. But oftentimes the county, when they come out, they're shutting off multiple valves to figure out what, sh what they need to shut down. And oftentimes that one valve for the specific association will shut off other streets, other associations. So, um, you know, again, if, if somebody has an issue where they're in the shower or something's going on, if the water's not working, uh, give us a call. The ladies in the office have the shutoffs listed on the counter and we'll try to do our best to let them know what's going on. And lastly, uh, as the annual meetings again progress, we have a board certification class scheduled for the end of February. So all the new board members, existing board members, anybody that wants to join, um, we're going to have that class. Uh, the CAMs are bringing those to each of the annual meetings, so the signs, sign up are with them. Um, if you're interested and you didn't know about it, shoot me an email. We'll get you signed up for the class. Um, we'll, it'll be in this room. We'll have uh, Webb Milton will be presenting. Um, kind of just going over the, the, the board member 101 basics and then following the state requirements. So take, be on the lookout for that. And again, if you're interested, let me know. And that's, that's it. And <clears throat> for the new board members, it is a state requirement uh, under the COA and HOA requirements that you attend a uh, board education class. So it is a requirement. Uh, that's why it is put on by First Service and the Federation Council who uh, deals in HOA and COA requirements. So keep in mind if, if you're new to your board or haven't been on your board for a while that they do require, the state does require you to have the certification. Right. So I appreciate you putting that together. Uh, There'll for, be, there'll be, for there'll the be some refreshments presents. and uh, breakfast items that go around now that everything's back open. So, and I know. That's correct. Yeah, we don't. We don't usually want to let that other one out. <laughs> uh, no, it, 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 but you're right. It is another option to. We definitely encourage folks to come because you get a lot of good information on just the expectations of being a board member. Um, it's not always told when you're getting nudged to be on the board uh, what exactly it takes. So it's a, it's a good uh, good uh, introduction there. 
There is, there is also a third option. Um, Bush Ross does a virtual education class on occasion. Uh, they send it to the Federation Board and First Service when they are going to be doing a virtual. So if you can't make the meeting and you don't feel secure in just signing the document that you understand everything within there, uh, we can always arrange for you to attend a virtual right. uh, session from Bush Ross. Thank you, Keith, and we will go into uh, committee reports. Uh, Liz, I know you have a presentation. Do you have anything else you want to discuss before that? I just wanted to let everybody know in the Health and Safety Committee, we have done our kickoff meeting to get our hurricane preparedness program underway. And uh, this year is a little different than last year. Last year we had to create from the bottom up. So, but anyway, we will keep you posted as far as we go. And as Keith said, it is March 7th when the symposium will be uh, available to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Janice, anything? Nothing. Thank you. Tom, you basically are turning it over to Dave today, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Barbara, do you have anything? I noticed Alan grabbed the mic away from you. I guess he didn't want you to talk. <laughs> Testing. Okay. Um, the website has been opened up to the Federation board members for knocking around and our feedback. And For beta testing. Beta testing, exactly. So I'm looking forward to hearing everyone's feedback in the up and coming week. And with that, I will turn it over to Alan to do his treasurer's report for the end of the third quarter. My that is correct. Thank you, Jack. Yes, this is the uh, uh, year to date through the end of the third quarter. It's April 1st through the end of December. Um, and um, the, uh, of course, it is unaudited, but this is, uh, this is the report. Uh, second page. The uh, total assets are $554,572 ,570 with a reserve fund uh, liabilities of 497,364, and total members' equity of 57,208. Uh, third page, the uh, receipts and disbursements. Uh, I mentioned at the last meeting after our audit was done, uh, and some some in the community are were were are are. Um, it's a it's a big deal. That are we talking revenues? Are we talking expenses? Are we talking something different, transfers in, uh, what's the money coming in. I'm presenting all this as receipts and disbursements. Um, according to the auditor and for the purposes of making sure that, that we don't pay taxes that we have to pay, he recognizes revenues as that money is expended. If it's not expended, it's not recognized as revenue. Most of that is put into the reserve accounts. So I'm just reporting on all receipts and disbursements. As you can see, the budgeted assessments um, is right on target, 61,800 uh, about that's come in. The other receipts, which is the amounts for the transfer fees mainly, small amounts of interest also, but uh, mostly transfer fees, a little over $60,000 so far for three quarters of the year. The general operating disbursements, administrative, uh, they're, they're all well well below budget. Administrative uh, items, uh, only 811 was spent. Utilities, a little over 1,000 spent. Contracts is actually under, and that's because we bill for the usage of 1904 building, um, which is used by not only the Federation, but by the master and by the COA, and they, they, they um, pay some of the operating fees, 1902? 1902. 1902, I'm sorry, I always get those mixed up. 1902 building, which is next to 1904. But they have reimbursed for last year's uh, usage, 
and it's more than this year's usage. We are actually uh, holding down costs since the Federation is not using that building very often. Uh, we're saving money on, on janitorial and, and other things. So that money is, uh, so that, that, that's good news. So the, uh, then the, the last page, the fourth page, um, as you can see, the reserves uh, landscape fund has 50,000 balance. Insurance deductible fund is just a fantastic year. This is great. Folks are taking care of their buildings. There's no fires and there's no more floods. Very little, only 10,000, little over 10,000 spent this year for, for three quarters of a year, which is great compared to historically uh, speaking. <laughs> yeah, I nice. see. Yeah, I see. Because um, historically it's been it's been very bad, but this is, this is real good news. Um, still have 132,000, almost 133,000 dollars in that reserve fund, which will which will be take us uh, into next year. Great, uh, let's continue to, to do that. Continue to make sure your fans are off when you leave for for, for the uh, uh, and, and water's turned off and things when you know when you go and leave leave for the. Uh, uh, if you're not here all year. Grounds cleanup fund balance is 50,000. Both of those, grounds cleanup and landscape, are just in case we have bad weather and we need those items. Legal fund is 25,000 in it, which is required by our AC1. Professional services fund uh, has 30,500 balance in it. Uh, we continue to, uh, we've dispersed 113,000, a little over that uh, so far this year. Um, that, that balance is for the rest of the year, plus the, the receipts that will be coming in. Uh, as you know, uh, some of that money does come in. A little over 4000 comes in each month, so we expect another 12500 or so to go into that professional services fund before the end of the year. The contracts fund um, has 43000 uh, and some and some change in it as a balance. The receipts in that fund are, this is basically um, contracts, the landscape contract, various contracts that are spent. Um, uh, and then um, the, the, your fees cover that and the contracts you expend. If the money is not spent, then it stays in the Federation. The, the receipts are, or, or if it comes back, for example, our landscape uh, contract has some penalties if the landscapers don't do the, the job uh, any, any month, they, they get a penalty. So money comes back to the Federation and goes into this landscape or this contracts uh, uh, fund. Um, small amounts of insurance, if the insurance amount is not quite right or, the, or there's, a, there's a rebate or, or, or uh, a different amount coming back that goes into that. So that's the 20,000 receipts. The 28,005 that was spent out of that and because there's money in that contract fund, as you know, we used that to provide the additional two fertilizations for palms this year, as we did last year. And that was paid for out of this contract to fund, so the associations didn't have to spend additional money for that. And of course, as, as, as uh, Liz will talk and, and as you'll approve, um, that those additional the, the proper fertilization for palms will be covered next year um, with, with the change in the, in the contract for that. Community promotions uh, fund, um, and, and I didn't mention, but the first column, the transfers in, this is, this is money that came into the, uh, the reserve fund at, at the beginning of the year based on the budget that was approved by the Federation, transferring some of the monies from the registration into those funds to cover these items so that again you don't have to pay for that your 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 assessments are lower because we don't need to pay for these items so community promotions fund um, did have a transfer in of uh, uh, at the beginning of the year continues to get receipts 12,006 and disbursements of 10,000 and as the new website um, which is nearing, we're getting close to, to rolling out, I think, the, the new website and changing it over to the new company, to J2. So those, those numbers, again, will change some because we'll be under the new contract and not the old. And the registration fees, and 
uh, again, 62,008 was transferred out. Um, receipts so far this year, 60,000 for a balance of 130, almost 132,000 in that registration fee. And that's, that's my report. Any questions? Any questions from the floor? Would you put up the first one? First slide. This one? The very first? Yeah. Did you have a question on it or just wanted to? You're fine with it? Okay. Any other questions, issues? Then thank you, Alan, for your report. Uh, that takes it to me. I know we are. We have a lot of work to do today. I'm going to discuss two issues, and then I will go on with the rest of the meeting. One is Keith brought up the trash collections, and for those of you who have your own trash bins that you wheel out to the end of your driveway, uh, after January 31st, Understand that FCC is brand new to the community. They're brand new to South Hillsborough County uh, to do trash collections. They have to learn uh, the routes, the streets within Kings Point uh, for picking up your trash. Uh, they know where the dumpsters are because they delivered them. But for those who have trash bins, uh, try and be a little patient and a little understanding. Uh, it's going to be a learning curve for them. Uh, if for some reason your trash is uh, missed, uh, it is not First Services uh, oversight of FCC for those. It is a county oversight. Uh, you will get faster action by calling the county uh, and letting them know that uh, FCC has missed your street or missed your home because the county will be the one that will be oversight of FCC environment, environmental. If it's a dumpster that's missed, please feel free to call Keith because uh, he has a contact uh, for the dumpster contract, but the rest is all of the, throughout the Kings Point is the county. Uh, and just keep that in mind and it would save a lot. I mean, you can call Keith, but he's just going to turn around and call the county, and it's better for the resident uh, to give the county notice than it is for the property management company to speak on behalf of the resident. So I would just ask that that be taken care of. Uh, the second item I want to discuss is occasionally uh, I like to torture myself by going through next door. <laughs> There, there was an article on Nextdoor regarding, and it happened to have been a Brown's tree truck that had driven into the lawn, uh, up to its axle when it backed into the lawn trying to get to a palm tree. And the question was, does anybody know what's going on? Is anybody uh, looking at it? Uh, it was discussed with Keith, I would say probably within five to 10 minutes of that occurrence, uh, First Service was aware of it. Browns reported it immediately uh, and is working to uh, ensure that any damage to that lawn uh, is taken care of post haste. Am I correct, Keith? I take it by your shaking, yes. So uh, if you see an occurrence, it's a lot easier to give First Service a call and say, hey, we just noticed this than it is to put out on next door and basically say no one always knows what's going on with his King's Point. Uh, we generally know what's going on, or at least Keith does, know what's going on within King's Point, and our vendors generally keep us informed when something such as that happens. So I would just ask for your cooperation and instead of putting things out on next door that we kind of uh, work within our community and work with our property management on it, I can tell you that First Service does respond uh, as the Federation does to any emails and we do attempt to resolve them as quickly as possible. And with that, I will uh, close my comments. Uh, we do have two comments on open forum. Uh, Rob, you wanted to discuss mowing around the ponds? 
you can go to the podium if you want. Or, or if you want, you can take uh, Dan's mic. Good morning. I'm Rob Davies, president of Gloucester J. And I'm the chairperson of the Master Association Pond Committee. Um, and we've been studying what makes healthy ponds and Florida-friendly landscaping, along with some of the work that Ryan and Liz have been doing. The ninth principle of Florida-friendly landscaping reads as follows, protect the waterfront. Implementing Florida-friendly landscaping design and maintenance methods, and I'm quoting, um, helps protect water bodies from pollution. If you live in a lake, bay, river, or other water body, keep fertilizers, pesticides, and other toxins away from the water by preserving a 10-foot maintenance-free zone between your landscape and the water. Do not mow, fertilize, or apply pesticides in that area. Even if you do not live immediately on the waterfront, the pesticides and fertilizers you apply to landscape affect the health of your water bodies and your water that comes out of your faucets. Um, and that drainage system is called a watershed. I mention that because I've talked to people with complaints and talked about our aquifer, and they've said, what's an aquifer? Uh, the choices you make at home have much further reaching consequences than you can imagine. And this is a document from the Florida Friendly Landscaping published by a collaboration of Florida Department of Environmental Protection, the University of Florida, and the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States. Uh, retention ponds have four roles listed in order of importance. Flood control, filtering out of pollutants, wildlife habitat, and aesthetics. Our present landscape practices are wanting in the first three of these priorities. In my role as a member of the Pond Committee, I met with Del Durr, Ryan Work, and Dave McGraw last April on the, uh, out at the garden and to discuss our desire to have a vegetative barriers around our ponds. It was a very short meeting. I was amazed because both Ryan and Dave agreed that that was an environmentally acceptable practice and it was important, and said they would include the vegetative barrier practices around the ponds in the new landscape contracts. When I came back from, the, from being up north this summer, Dell uh, let me know that the landscape committee decided not to follow this principle, and I was told that I needed, I needed to do more education for the community on this topic, and that's why I'm here today, to educate you, the leaders of Kings Point. Ryan and Liz presented a seminar on Florida Friendly Landscaping this fall to about 50 participants, and the Pond Committee hosted a seminar on Healthy Ponds with 100 participants in October. We had presenters from Swift Mud, Southwest Florida Water Management District, and the Solitude Lake Management, who is our pond contractor. Both seminars mentioned the principle of protecting our waterfronts through no mow zones. I recommend that the landscape contract be amended to include proper vegetative barriers around of our ponds. Um, and as an aside, uh, next, next uh, Wednesday at 9 a.m. in this room, we'll have a uh, presentation by uh, two individuals, one from Cooperative Extension and one from Hillsborough County, furthering our education efforts in those two areas. Um, thank you. Okay, uh, one thing, Rob, is the associations uh, do not own up to the water's edge, there is a certain uh, footage uh, that basically is owned by the master. Uh, the master has worked with uh, the Federation uh, when the landscape contracts were put together to mow to water's edge. If the master board would like to send to the Federation board a letter uh, that you no longer request uh, the Federation landscapers to mow to water's edge and said that you would prefer us, that they would prefer us not to mow uh, on their property. Uh, we would be more than glad to work with the landscapers, uh, but I can tell you that there may be a number of residents who complain about uh, tall grass where the last two or three feet prior to the uh, edge of the pond becomes. So the mowing to the water's edge was an agreement between the master 
the Federation with the landscapers, and if they want to change that, uh, we don't own the land, the master does, and we will follow whatever direction they want us to take. Okay? Yeah, the Pardon? The the no, we're speaking solely of mowing around the ponds. That is correct. Uh, uh, Dave McGraw, uh, there's one other thing that is important uh, that needs to be understood by the community. When we don't cut within t three feet of the pond, the, the grass will grow very high. Uh, we went through this before and there, we had a lot of complaints from people in the community that it looked bad out their back windows, that type of thing. So there does need to be some education to the community as to why this is the best thing for the community. And that's the other step we probably need to take. Can I, if I may add just to the, um, as your research may go, um, maybe grass is not the proper uh, planting to be there. There might be some other uh, good quality aquatic plant type items that actually look nice. They may look nicer to go there. No, no problem, but we'll be glad to work with the master and whatever they would prefer that we do with the landscapers on that aspect of it. Jack, there's a gentleman on the right that has a question. I don't, I do not, and I do not believe the Federation Board or the Landscape Committee disagree with you. Unfortunately, the association doesn't own the edge land of the pond, and it is something that I think the residents are going to have to speak to the master about and give the master direction on how they want to deal with the landscapers and the Federation on that issue. Uh, we will follow whatever the residents and the master would like us to do. Uh, from that landscape perspective. Uh, the other item on the uh, sign up for open form is Bob Peterson. Morning, I'm Bob Peterson. Live in High Gate Four. I totally understand the concerns about mowing around the edge of the pond, but I have to tell you the other side of the story. There are a number of associations in which people have already started to take Florida-friendly plantings as. You got to you got to hold it up I closer. Hold it clo yeah. Oh yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, many associations have already started. Uh, what we consider to be Florida, Florida friendly plantings. In fact, there are experimental plots out there to find those right plants so that the, the plants along the edge of the pond do not totally in inhibit the site of the pond. That's not the intent at all. There are plants that need to be there. They absorb the nutrients that are flowing off of the driveways, flowing out of the fertilizer that goes on. We need three basic things, I think. We need to have, first of all, um, a restriction on the mowing. Um, and that might not happen right away, but until we get those plants identified and, and, and the right plants put in there so that, that uh, you can still enjoy the pond, but it will re remove those nutrients. Secondly, we don't want the clippings to be pushed into the pond, and that happens now. The other day I was looking out my window and here was a, a vehicle going by with a spray tank on the back, spraying right along and into the pond. We can't have chemicals going into the pond. It not only those herbicides kill the plants that are that are there that are absorbing the nutrients, but they are affecting the new, they are affecting the wildlife that are in the ponds and they use those ponds. Some people have described our our past planting practices and our past maintenance practices as creating. An art, uh, a, a desert. When I first moved here many years ago, there were a lot more birds. There was a lot more wildlife. And I could catch a lot more fish in those ponds. 
we need to take up these Florida friendly plantings. I'm sorry, that's hard to say. And, 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 and make, more, make it a more natural landscape. Um, we certainly want to work with every association on the pond that the pond committee can find that has these concerns. We will educate, we've started to educate, and we will continue to do that. And we invite you all to attend those, uh, attend those presentations because you're an important part of the communication that needs to go back and to be supportive of the wildlife and uh, the uh, landscaping in this community. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that is all that is signed up for open forum. Uh, with that, and having no old business or unfinished business, we will move to new business, and I will turn the meeting over to Liz uh, for her presentation uh, and approval of the amendment for the Browns Tree Service contract to do the palm fertilization. Good morning, everybody. It's really nice to see more and more of you coming out to these meetings in person instead of by proxy. Um, I like to see lots of faces here. The Palm and Hardwood Tree Committee was given the charge by the Federation Board to develop an amendment to the Browns Tree Service contract that is currently in place. And that, that contract is a three-year contract and we're almost finished uh, going through, no, go back, please. Go back. There you go. <laughs> At any rate, we're, we're charged to develop a contract to add fertilization to the palm fertilization to the existing Brown's tree service contract. Um, and we've done a lot of work with the palms and we've made several uh, presentations. We've talked about pruning that needed to be done and we've talked about don't cut a green frond, only a brown frond. However, and there's always a however, unless the green frond is causing uh, safety issues uh, for pedestrians or on the roof of your house and so on. Now we can go. So, why are we here? We're here to look at the amendment uh, to present you with some information so you have a better understanding of what it is we're asking you to vote on today. Uh, fertilization, we did a whole seminar on that, is critical to the health of the palms. Need to look at, recognize the soil in Kings Point, the composition of the soil in Kings Point, and produce a fertili fertilizer compound that will be uh, can be used in this particular soil. So all the soil in Florida is not the same. Miami's different, Jacksonville's different, so all of that needs to be taken into consideration. And moving the fertilization to the tree committee, tree contract would um, be more beneficial because they are the tree experts. <coughs> And we, and initiating, we've talked about initiating our healthy uh, program for healthier palms by our uh, pruning, et cetera, and now it's time to feed them. Okay? No? Yeah, all right, there we go. Um, almost all of our palms are, uh, or the most common nutrient deficiency is potassium. Uh, Putting a compound together 
that, is, that has micronutrients in a, a slow release fashion is the best way to uh, feed the palms. And once again, we need to understand that we're looking at a, a multi micronutrient compound to maintain healthy, healthy palms. Providing the appropriate uh, formula for palms is either costly or difficult to do. This is a sample of, or picture of a sample of a packaged product that has been put together specifically for palms. The landscaper had been doing the fertilization and some of the fertilizations that are used by the landscaper have absolutely no impact or effect on, on the health of the, of the palm or improving the health of the palm. So this is something that can be found locally and uh, we are making some very specific recommendations in this amendment. We are, and we'll go into that in just a second. But it's very important to have the specific needs for the fertilization of the palm in the, in the amendment to be sure that they are adhered to by the contract providers. Okay. Okay. When? When should we fertilize? You know, palms have a life cycle. The best time to fertilize palms to get maximum uh, effect on the, on the palms is to do it, to do May, August, and February of each contract year. And that the uh, $13,800 per application uh, is the cost that we will have. The, <coughs> excuse me, the fertilization needs to, uh, fertilizer needs to be packaged in accordance to the formula you see listed. Doesn't mean much to you or to me, but it does to the uh, uh, grounds trees. How the application is done is also critical. Many of you have come and talked to me and several other people, and they say, I, they just fertilize the palms. What's this? They just kind of chicken feed them? And uh, no, that's not supposed to be. The, uh, there's a certain amount of fertilizer that needs to be applied each time, and the application must be from the, the trunk under the canopy, away from the, away from the trunk of the tree. And it needs to be spread evenly. When we did our presentation on palms and we showed you how, how, the, how the roots grow, that, was very, that, that makes this very critical. And the fertilizer should not touch the trunk of the palm. Why? The fertilizer is very acidic, and when it is touches the trunk of the palm, then it can cause damage to the palm and maybe even, even kill it. And along those lines, since it is extremely acidic, we determined that this G needed to be in the, con in the amendment as well. The fertilization product is an acid material and as such, shall be cleaned from the sidewalks, driveways, and streets immediately following the application to prevent staining. As you can see, we are pretty, pretty specific in what we need, need to have done. Okay. <clears throat> Money. Um, when you, you look at this slide, you'll see that year one, there is nothing there. Well, because that's because this year that's coming to an end, this contract year that's coming to an end, the end of, of March, did not have the fertilizer in 
the in Brown's contract. So uh, by adding it, it will be in year two. Some of the some of the money for this or to to co pay for the cost of this is already being paid by you elsewhere. We are looking at, and you'll hear from the landscape uh, committee for the new recommendation for the new landscape contracts. That fertilization has been removed from the landscape contract. The, that money then that has already been budgeted within what we had before will take a shift. So it will shift and uh, pay for the fertilization to be done by uh, Brown's Tree Service. In actuality, we are looking at perhaps about a $35,000 savings by moving these, these things around. This is a picture of a uh, slide of what you will see in, in your amendment. And notice everything that I mentioned to you before is included here and uh, in the next slide as well. The language is very, very clear. Looking at the next slide, um, it says six, B, the contractor shall not be responsible for insect and disease control of palms or trees. In the, in the original um, contract, it stated that they would not be responsible for fertilization of palms. So that has been taken out of there and that's why there's a change there. Uh, and hopefully these, uh, talking a little bit about these two slides is, is helpful for you for when you um, get to look and vote on the amendment. We're doing all of this to ensure that we have healthy, green, flowing fronds with, on our palms, so it looks like this. There's Hardy Harry telling you this is the way we need to go. And he says, it's easy as one, two, three. Proper fertilization formula and appli proper application of the fertilizer and proper trimming of the palms to make a healthy, uh, healthy, healthy palm in our community. Okay, any questions? Thank you, Liz. Oops, uh, few, before yeah. before we get a question and get into discussion, can I have a motion to approve the contract uh, for the palm fertilization, <laughs> and then we can get into discussion? Any second? No, the procedure is to get the motion going and then discuss yeah, the Yeah, you've got to get the motion going, and then we can discuss it. So we have a motion. Pardon? And over B. And a second. Thank you, Rob. Rob Davies. You can do the Rob. So I assume there is discussion, and I would ask that you come up to the front of the room to use the mic. Is this, yeah, okay. Um, now you're talking about how it's... Can you, um, can you give us your name and your Steve association? Steve Miller with Radisson 1. Uh, you talk about the uh, acidity of the feeding for the palms. So what is that going to do to the bushes that are around the bottom of the palm trees? It should not because it should the application should be under the canopy of the palms. And if it's applied appropriately, it should not go on any other plant. That's the key, and, and we, you all have seen how it's been done in the past, and certainly we'll keep an eye on it now, I hope. Yes. Carol Hester, Fairfield C. 
Uh, is this going to include every palm in Kings Point? That is an excellent question. Uh, the palms that are currently within the contract, uh, existing contracts, will be the ones that are, are uh, fertilized. There are some palms in the community that are self-shedding, some that we think are palms or not palms, but that's, that's an issue that we will be clarifying, this committee will be clarifying. You're looking at your queen palms and your sable palms and Washingtonians. And then secondly, uh, is, the, is there any coordination between the application and then the lawn people coming through and possibly raking it out or like they do with our mulch? <laughs> they don't do that. <laughs> uh, we, that's something that we'll um, take, make note and we will take, take a look at all of that as well. Dan Page, treasurer of Andover D. The August fertilization, how will that be affected by all the rain? Will the rain wash it away, or will that serve any purpose? Well, it's a very, very slow release formula, and the rain should, should not wash it away. If it's laid properly, and it's spread out evenly, you're not looking at clumps of fertilizer that can be washed away. Rob Davies, Gloucester J. Um, are you aware that there's a Hillsborough County ordinance that no nitrogen or uh, phosphorus fertilizers are supposed to be applied between June and September 30th? Yes, I'm aware of that. And in looking at uh, that particular piece where they're talking about, especially where, when you're close to water, et cetera, and our palms are not there. And the second, the second thing is you're talking about getting rid of the fertilizer so it doesn't stain. The, one of the biggest problems with polluting of the waterways is, is what runs off our impervious surfaces. So any fertilizer that gets on the impervious surfaces immediately washes in the pond. So you know, you're, you're part about cleaning off any of the fertilizer getting on those impervious surfaces is really important. And the, and the third thing is um, don't apply fertilizer before a big rainstorm because it's just going to wash off. Well, one would hope that the contractor understands that as well. And I'm sure they will. I mean, we're going to the tree uh, specialists, and I'm sure they, they know all of this. Yes, sir. Doug Friedel, uh, Tremont 2. You talk about the, um, and Rob kind of asked, the acidity of the thing, getting out the sidewalks and the thing. Doesn't it go right to the street drains and don't the street drains empty into the retention ponds? If, they, if this is applied appropriately, that should not be a problem because there's a specific amount noted in here for um, 100 square feet of canopy. And if it's less than that or more than that, it, it needs to be done uh, in the, under the canopy only. It should not be in the grass, et cetera, where it, um, it can wash away as well. Uh, the second thing, who, who's going to do the washdown if it is? Uh, say that again? I don't know. If, if there's need for a washdown from a hard surface, who's going to do it? From a hard, from the sidewalk, et cetera? Sidewalk or, or drive? Well, or? The, the Browns Tree Service is going to clean it up. They have to clean up the area before they leave. Blow it off. Third thing, you said it shouldn't be applied to uh, any bushes under the palm. And look at the picture there. How would they avoid it not getting on the bushes? Well, that's just an idea of a sample of what the canopy looks like, not the, not the plants underneath. I, very, I don't know of uh, many palms that have that kind of uh, setup, but that would be up to uh, Browns to, to take care of. Remember, we're going to the expert tree people, and they should know that. I have to put some faith out there. <coughs> yeah. 
I heard that. Uh, Lucy Malakos from Edinburgh. I just have a question about when you put up the year one, year two, year three, and you said year one, there's no cost. Is year one start this April 1st? Yes. Does no. Does it year no. two? No. No. Year two starts April 1st. Oh, so this was, this is an amendment, so it started last year. Okay, that's what I just couldn't right. understand We're that. Right. Ta tagging it into the existing Brown Tree Service contract that we're coming to uh, the end of first fiscal year at the end of oh, March, okay. and which is why we said then right. we will do May, August, right. and February. I was just, I thought this was the year one coming up. Am I the last one? Oh, here. Oh, okay. Currently the palm fertilization is done by each of the landscaping vendors. So they do two applications for every section themselves, and then one of the vendors does two additional applications for the entire community. So that's what the big the change is. It's going away from the landscape vendors to the tree vendor. I'm Jim Ninehouse. I'm uh, from Richmond. Um, first of all, thank you for all the work that you guys have all done on this. Uh, my question, though, would be: This is a contractor who's presently has a contract here at Kings Point and it's being added to what they're doing now. So what steps or how do you go about making sure that the price that they give us to have this service done is fair and reasonable? Do you get pricing from other contractors or do you, I mean, how do you, just, how do you arrive at being comfortable with spending, I think it's an extra, is it 40,000 a year or whatnot? Uh, it, yes, we did look at um, other companies that could, could do the distribution and um, this price by, uh, or recommended cost by Browns, is right in the, in the same area. There are many that are much higher. But, uh, so it's competitive it, with, with what? It's competitive with the, the, with the larger uh, companies, yes. Okay. Thank you. My name is Bill Gordon. I'm with Masterpiece too, and also on the Palm Committee. A lot of you people that are worrying about the runoff from the fertilizer and all that, just to let you know, a pound and a half of fertilizer is equal to about one cup of fertilizer. So you're not talking about a lot of fertilizer that's gonna be spread all over the place. And if you put that under a 100 foot canopy, you will have very little fertilizer there. Thank you. Bill, before you leave, uh, I know that Liz gets the kudos for doing the presentation, but the, and for those of you who don't know, is Bill is a part of the Tree and Palm Committee and has worked very closely with Liz and the other members of the committee in putting together this package. So Bill, I appreciate the work that you've put in. I know you have a lot of background and experience in the horticulture and plants. So thank you very much for all the work you've done on that. 50 he, years. Yeah. He. Uh, we were lucky to have Bill on Manchester 2's POC. And uh, when he first came in, this was roughly four years ago, the first thing he said, he goes, we shouldn't be trimming the palm trees like that. Yeah. And that, that was where we awoke to the fact that we're trimming too much of the palm trees. So. Bill's contributed quite a bit. He's brought his experience, and we appreciate you, Bill. Uh, that's yeah. true, he, and I call him my mentor because <laughs> whenever I have a question, it's and he's he's got the answer. And Jack, you took some wind out of my sails at the very end. I was going to recognize the total community, uh, the total committee, mo many of most of which are sitting representing their associations. Yep. And and understand that. <laughs> Liz did a presentation. This uh, amendment to the contract, I think, Liz, you have been working on it for probably the last four or five months doing the research, uh, getting into the University of Florida's recommendations, talking to other fertilization companies, uh, working with Bill Gordon and the other people on the committee. It wasn't just, well, let's just do this. There was a lot of research time and effort put into the recommendation that originally came from the Tree and Palm Committee to let the 
tree and palm uh, company do the fertilization. Uh, and that was the recommendation of the board. When Liz came on to the board uh, last March, uh, she assumed the responsibility of the chair and has been working on effectuating this. And we decided, okay, if we're gonna do it, let's do it when we do the landscape. So we take it out of the landscape and give it to the tree uh, contractor all at the same time. So it is a coordinated effort on both uh, committees. So. Uh, Liz, I appreciate the effort that you and your committee uh, did in putting this together. But understand, this just wasn't a bunch of people who know nothing about fertilization, and nothing about palms, uh, making a decision on what to do. It was by an entire committee that put in a lot of hours uh, and effort and had a lot of meetings on this subject. Uh, and we gave Liz, uh, as a board, when she would come in and report to the board what was going on, we gave her a little hard time on micronutrients and uh, different formula formulas and why they were such as they were. So we basically didn't have uh, much problem once we got it from Liz and we had a great deal of confidence in the recommendations the committee was making. Thank you. But I will tell you, when I was given this glorious opportunity uh, to work on this committee, I said, oh, Lordy, Lordy, thank you, Bill, my mentor, and the rest of the committee, because they know more than I did at that time. We have one more. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma <laughs> I'm Elsa Mendiola from Knowles II. Um, Mr. Wilkins uh, stated that the prior fertilization was done by the landscaping committee. By the landscaping? Yes. What was the decision to take it away from them? I mean, who fertilized the palm trees before? The landscapers. So why are we going with brown? Uh, why are we adding additional costs in the financials? Is it, is it a, are you taking the, the cost? No, we're shifting, shifting money from one to the other. The money that was used to, in the landscape contract will be used for this for fertilization will take a shift. But yeah. why was the decision because to do that? Because the, the fertilization of the palms was not um, appropriate and needed a little more care, and that's the amendment now brings it to the tree uh, company, and the tree company is the expert in trees, not overall palms. landscaping. I understand. Thanks. Thank you. Part of your answer is also, uh, Bill Gordon, again, uh, started looking at the way the contractors were fertilizing the palm trees, and he said, they're not doing it right. So again, all leads go back to Bill. <laughs> thank you, Bill. Yes, thank you, Bill, and it's true. The man is a world of information and willing to share. So thank you, and thank you to the committee for the hard work. Any other comment, discussion, questions? You got to use the mic, please. Judy, I know you hate to walk to the front of the room, but we all need to hear you. Judy Newson, Fairfield A. Um, I was just wondering why the landscaping charge in our budgets are going up eight dollars and something if we're taking money out and moving it to. Uh, oh, you're going to get it. Well, they're going to be, yeah. Oh, okay. Fine. Uh, yeah. The, the landscaping committee is going to go through the, the, the landscaping portion of it. But just quickly, because there's a couple of questions about it, I know uh, we had a summary sheet for the uh, application costs. So currently, right now, uh, when the landscapers have done the fertilization applications, it was about $75,000 per year. And uh, with this new contract, again, there's three applications versus four. Um, it drops down to $41,400. So that's the, the net savings of the $34,000 that Liz alluded to, so. Any other questions? Then we'll call the question. Ma Bell, would you? Uh,
and try and do it quickly because we have to do this twice. <laughs> I can do quickly if you can understand me. So <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. Acadia 2. Oh, sorry, Acadia. I'm sorry, sir. I'm really, Acadia. See, I'm rushing already. Acadia, yes, by proxy. Acadia 2. Andover A? No, by proxy. Andover B? Yes, by proxy. Andover C? Yes, by proxy. Andover D? Yes. Andover F? Yes. Andover H? No, by proxy. Bedford A? Yes, by proxy. Bedford C. Yes, by proxy. Bedford E. Yes. Bedford F. Yes, by proxy. Bedford G. Brookfield. Yes, by proxy. Cambridge A. Yes, by proxy. Cambridge B. Yes. Cambridge C. Cambridge F. Yes, by proxy. Cambridge H. Yes, by proxy. Cambridge I. Yes, by proxy. Cambridge J. Yes. Cambridge K. Yes, by proxy. Cambridge L. Yes, by proxy. Cambridge M. Yes. Canton Court D. She left. But, oh, you're there. Okay, yes. Corinth, <laughs> I stopped for a minute, sorry. Devonshire, Dorchester A, yes, by proxy. Dorchester B, yes, by proxy. Dorchester C, Edinburgh. Fairborn, yes. Fairfield A, yes. Fairfield C, yes. Fairfield D, yes. Fairfield E, yes by proxy, Fairfield G, yes by proxy, Fairfield H, yes by proxy, Gloucester A, yes by proxy, Gloucester B. Yes, by proxy. Gloucester D. Yes, by proxy. Gloucester E. Yes, by proxy. Gloucester F. Gloucester H. Yes, by proxy. Gloucester J. You said yes, right? Okay, sorry, sir. Gloucester L. Wait, I had Gloucester J actually. Oh, so Gloucester J is yes. Okay. Um, Gloucester L, yes by proxy. Gloucester M, yes by proxy. Gloucester N, yes by proxy. Gloucester P, yes. Grantham, yes. Highgate B, yes by proxy. Highgate C, Highgate D. Yeah. Highgate F. Yes, by proxy. Highgate 2. Yeah. Highgate 3. Yes, by proxy. Highgate 4. Yes, by proxy. Huntington. Yeah. Idlewood. Yes, by proxy. Inverness. Yes, by proxy. Jameson. Kensington, yes. Knowles 1, yes by proxy, Knowles 2, yes. Knowles 3, yes by proxy, Lancaster 1, yes by proxy, Lancaster 2, yes. Lancaster 3, yes by proxy, Manchester 1, 
Manchester 2. Manchester 3. Yes, by proxy. Manchester 4. Yes, by proxy. Maplewood. Yes. Nantucket 1. Yes. Nantucket 2. Yes, by proxy. Nantucket 3. Yes, by proxy. Nantucket 4. Yes, by proxy. Oakley Green. Yes, by proxy. Oxford 2. Portsmouth, Portsmouth, yes. Princeton, yes. Quail Pass, yes, by proxy, Radisson 1, yes, by proxy, Radisson 2, yes, by proxy, Richmond, yes, by proxy, Somerset, yes. Southampton 1, yes. Southampton 2, Tremont 1. Yes, by proxy. Tremont 2. Yes, by proxy. Villeroy. Yes. Worlington. Yes, by proxy. Mr. President, you have 4,693 counts voted yes with 99% with 89 association voted yes. And you have 48 counts or units that voted no with 1% with two association. Then the motion has passed. And we will get that amendment signed and listed on the website along with the Brown contract. Correct, Ma Bell? Yes, sir. <clears throat> And with the committee who worked over Christmas to get this put together, I will turn the meeting over to Dave McGraw. Uh, with much appreciation and as long as you don't say ho, 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 uh, you can go ahead and do your entire presentation. I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, we're here today to look at the landscape contract renewals and, and also the uh, improved uh, contract over the course of the last three or four months, especially starting in October. Uh, we did an extensive review of the landscape contract. Um, I want to thank Janice Kincaid from way back when when she kept great notes with the committee because we used those when we were looking through the contract. And it, and I'd also like to thank Barb Suave, uh, who was very nice, attended a lot of the meetings and contributed. Um, so, so that helped, uh, that was helpful. Uh, the committee uh, did go through a RFP process, request for proposal on new vendors. Um, and I'm gonna have the committee go through our findings. Uh, first off, Frank Rip is going to go through the RFP process itself, how we, did it, the integrity of the process, and the results of the RFP process. Uh, Jim Allen is going to come along and is going to explain the internal review that the committee did uh, with documentation, massive documentation from each one of the uh, contractors. And fourthly, uh, Del, Del Durr is going to go through the uh, uh, what we call profile by customer to give us an idea of who are the customers, the vendors that we're looking at, are they capable of handling our landscape? Uh, a lot of sm smaller customers, in fact, uh, smaller landscapers, if you throw a million dollar contract at them, they, it's really hard for them to maintain it, and that's kind of what we're looking at. Can these guys, do they have the capability of handling our contracts? Uh, after that, I'll go through changes to the landscape contract. Keith was gonna uh, do some impact to budget based on our decisions. And after that, I have a few slides that I'd like to go through showing you some of the stuff you haven't seen before, the actual bids on the contracts, as well as the uh, extra uh, costs involved, that the cost sheet at the back where you, uh, if you wanna buy a plant or you wanna buy something, and we'll show that for each of the vendors. But uh, first, we'll go with Frank. Frank, it's yours. Can, can I use your microphone? And Frank, before you start, and for those in attendance, uh, outside of our insurance 
Uh, I think, Keith, you will agree, this is the largest expenditure contract that we have. Uh, it's in the millions of dollars. Uh, so please pay attention to what they're, they're doing. Uh, I can tell you they put a lot of work into this and in, in the work they did. But if you look, this is the single largest contract that we do. Uh, in total for landscaping. Right. Our proposal to you is $11,789,000 plus some change. But if you want to think about it broadly, just say it's a $12 million situation. Basically, every one of the four sections is a million dollar contract per year. So it's a lot of money. We, ex we have gr high expectations out of the vendors we bring in here. We want them to do the job correctly the first time. Uh, a lot of that is being enforced by contract changes. A lot of things in the background on grading have changed. We'll go through that for you. But yes, it's a big contract. Frank? Thank you, Dave. Hello, everybody. Good morning. We'll start out, uh, I believe, the first slide is up there. The RFP vending bids. The communications with all vending vendors was handled by the Federation attorney. The attorney sent out to 26 vendors requests for bids for the four landscape sections in Kings Point. The attorney only received six vendors response for the four landscape sections. The vendors who responded were the following, Down to Earth, Brightview, Russell, Artistry, Buccaneer, and Davy Tree. Although the overall response was not the best, the six vendors who did respond was good. The attorney met with the LOC committee to turn over the six vendor bids who responded. The LOC committee started to review all six bids, vendor bids. Of the six vendor bids who responded, the committee found one vendor significantly higher bid than the other five vendors' bids. The vendor who was the highest was Davy Tree. The committee decided not to continue to review any further because of its significantly higher bid, and Davy Tree was noted of, of this decision. This meant the LOC had only five vendors to review for four sections, landscape sections. Two of the five remaining vendors only submitted bids for the two sections, which was section two and section four. These vendors was Artistry and Buccaneer. The other three vendors, Brightview, Russell, and Down to Earth, submitted bids for all four sections. All of the above played a role on the LOC committee's decisions on the four landscape sections. And uh, Keith, I guess we could go to the uh, RF bids, please, on section one first. Okay. As you can see on the uh, slide up on the screen, you're looking at four bars. The four landscape people who responded, the vendors, was Brightview, Down to Earth, and Russell, and Davy Tree, as you can see on the bottoms. You'll see a lot of the pricings. The bars indicated what they submitted on their bids. Okay, and as you can see, Davy Tree, again here, was the highest of all those four bidders. Go to uh, the next uh, slide, please, which is section two. Okay, on this one we have all six vendors submitted their bids. And again, you'll see the bars indicating the uh, bid vendors' bids. And again, Davy Tree was again highest. We go to the next uh, slide, please, which is section three. On this one, we had four vendors only submitted bids. And again, that was Brightview, Down to Earth, Russell, and Davy Tree. Again, the bars are indicating the uh, amount of the vendor bids. And again, Davy Tree 
has the highest bar on that bid. We'll go to the next uh, section four, please. Okay. Over here, we have all six vendors that responded. And as the bars are indicating, Davy Tree again was the highest bidder on section four. And uh, this completes my uh, presentation on the RFP. I'd like to change, uh, turn it over to Jim Allen for his next presentation. Hopefully, thank you. Thanks, Frank. Um, good morning. Uh, what I want to talk about now are the, the qualification or, or the grading process that the committee went through uh, for each of the contractors. Um, when the bids all came back in, the, our attorney, as Frank had mentioned, uh, we had a bid opening party, if you will. And each member of the committee got a stack, and I'm not lying, this high of all of the bids that came back in. So we had to end up reviewing each one of those bids. As a result of reviewing those bids, we saw that some of the information was inconsistent in each of the bid packages. So the committee worked with the attorneys, as Frank had mentioned before, and we gave um, a list of 26 additional questions that went out to each, uh, each contractor and each uh, bid package. In some of the instances, some of those uh, questions were answered in the bid package, and we just simply asked the uh, contractor to, or the bid uh, respondent to indicate that their answer was in the bid package and we would find it, but if not, we expected an answer. So of those 26 questions, they all went out and all of the information came back. Uh, the committee then looked at those bid packages and the responses to those 26 questions and uh, <clears throat> broke them down into five different categories. You can see the categories uh, here on the, on the page and Dell will go into a little bit more detail. But the uh, five categories, we looked at the qualifications and the experience of each uh, bid, uh, bidding company. We looked at their ability to comply with the terms and conditions and the scope of the work and the service that we expected. We looked at the pricing. We looked at their philosophy and their style and their fit uh, with our business practices and our expectations. And we also looked at the ability to provide an adequate service in accordance with the uh, proposed contracts. Each uh, member of the committee, because we all had our own bid packages and we all had our own responses, and yes, there were some committee discussions about the bid packages, but we were all given a grading sheet. And what you will see is uh, on the grading sheet that each one of us uh, looked through the information and on those five major categories uh, provided grades. And we, uh, it was a, it was a um, <clears throat> A zero to ten uh, rating system that we were uh, we were looking at, and what we ended up doing was uh, doing it individually and on our own. So it wasn't a group think; it was an individual. Um, uh, ind each committee member looked at this on their own and sent our information back in. What was interesting is that when we did this, uh, we saw that while some of the committee members were rating fairly high. Some committee members were rating that same company fairly low, but that high and low rating stayed consistent across every one of the companies. So if you started out high bidding on uh, rating one company, you're gonna stay high rating them all. If you started out low, you're gonna stay low. The band stayed the same. The committee uh, came up with the same, uh, same rating system all the way across. As we were looking at these uh, ratings, we then had to determine which was most important and we had to weight each one of these categories. So when we looked at weighting the categories, and I believe if we just kind of go back, there you go. On the um, far uh, right-hand side, you'll see the multipliers that we apply to our raw scores. And the best way to think about this is, let's go back to school. You look at your final grade. And um, <clears throat> we basically said that 10% of, of your final grade is gonna be your qualifications and experience. 15% of their final grade was going to be the ability to comply with the standards of, move, I thought that was 50. Okay, 40%, what does it look like that adds up to 10? Oh no, I'm sorry, it does. Um, okay, I take that back. Uh, so 40% uh, of their final grade was going to be on pricing, 
15% uh, was going to be on their ability to provide the service, and uh, business practices was 15%, and then 20% was on their ability to deliver the service. So what we looked at was that we had to recognize that it's not all just price or it's not all just the quality of service that we were expecting. We had different uh, weightings uh, for each one of those different uh, components. And what you'll see on the bottom of the screen is, um, and I believe it is on the next page, uh, you will see that what the committee came up with are weighted averages for each of the uh, five contractors who we ultimately came up and uh, started making our evaluations. So uh, that's how we ended up wait, uh, waiting and reviewing and e evaluating the scores and the bid packages. And I now like to turn it over to Dell, who will uh, talk to you about uh, the additional information that we ask for from each of the contractors to help us with our decisions. Good morning. Okay, um, my slide is contractor's profile overview. And as Jim just um, ended his um, presentation with the um, committee's rating score, um, up here you'll see on the second line the landscaping, uh, the landscape grading, which was uh, for Brightview, 98.6, Russell, 98.4, uh, artistry and buccaneer uh, was not applicable and for down to earth it was 96.5 um, because Brightview is the only public holding company um, we are able to share their financials with you the other contractors are privately owned so we are not allowed to um, share those figures with you and it was at their request as well. Uh, what you see up here for Brightview, uh, the date of their financials that was uh, shared with us was in September, it was dated September 2021. For Russell, it was dated December 20, um, 2020. For Artistry, it was October 2021. Buccaneer, it was December 20th, 2020, excuse me, and DTE the same, December 31st, 2020. Uh, for Brightview, and for those of you that might be new to the uh, community, Brightview used to be in Kings Point under the name of Valley Crest. Um, and they are also the largest landscaping company in the country. Um, their annual sales is two million five hundred fifty-three thousand six hundred. Their net income is forty-six thousand three hundred. Sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Okay, uh, net equity one million. Excuse me, I'm using the wrong letter. 342,700. Cash balances, 123,700. Their total assets, 2 billion, two, excuse me, three. Dell. My letters, are, my numbers are very small. I'm having a hard time I reading them. I know, it's 123 million. I'm, I'm having a hard time reading this. They're very small. Sorry about that. Okay, and... Um, Thank you. Okay, there are other contracts. Um, Florida contracts, three. Okay, I have 3,500. Um, going down to their headquarters, uh, where they're located, um, Brightview is in Pennsylvania, Russell's location is in Georgia, and Artistry is in Florida. Buccaneer is also in Florida, as is DTE. Uh, number of employees for um, Brightview is 22,000. Russell is 600. Artistry is 320. Buccaneer, 120. And DTE, 
1,400? Yep. 1,400. And that's all I have. Uh, we're going to jump here to contracts and changes made to the contracts during the course of this, which you're be, you'll, you'll be voting on soon. Um, understand that we did not send out a red line copy of the contract because the changes were so numerous, we decided just to call it a, a new contract. Uh, but starting, the one thing I noticed we missed was uh, moving the fertilization uh, from uh, our contract at the landscape and sending it to the Palm and Tree Committee. So that should be one of the bullet points up here, but for some reason we missed it. Um, we have, in, in the report itself, we've enhanced the reporting that you get every week. Uh, if you remember, you, you've been getting a spreadsheet that basically tells you nothing, but we've, re we've recently had them upgrade that to iAuditor, which is a state-of-the-art uh, platform that uses their cell phones and they take pictures and they document what's going on. Uh, one of our biggest gripes was the contract says that the manager for the area must walk the property every week. We're forcing them in the contract to take an auditor, walk the property, document for you that what's going on, good or bad, in your community. Uh, it's a work in process, um, but I have a feeling that it's, it's going pretty good, according to Ryan. Uh, but we do want to hear your feedback. If, you're, if your contractor is not doing it well or they need more improvement, using iAuditor, uh, get, get some feedback to Ryan and the committee. I did talk to a Russell gentleman yesterday who was actually taking pictures, and he said he loved the software that he was using an older version of something else, and he says this is light years ahead of it. So hopefully we're going to get some good information from the contractors, the managers that are walking the property. Okay. Um, the next one is we changed the uh, con contract cuttings. We had f uh, 42 cu cuts per year. And discussion with primarily Jack was leading this, but. Uh, we changed to, uh, to a range of 42 to 46 cuts per year. Uh, that allows, if there's a rain out or something during the year, um, and grass is growing, growing good when we're only supposed to be cutting once a year, or one, uh, once every two weeks, we can tell them to do another cut for no charge. It's within the contract. So at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year, we can ask them to do some additional cuts. Um, we've improved the termination language in the contracts. Um, we, the Federation has allowed a 60-day uh, no-cause termination of a contractor, which we hope we never have to use. But we've significantly changed the termination clause for the landscaper. Um, if they're unhappy with what's going on, they, give us, they have to give us 30 days uh, to rectify the issue. If it's not rectified, they can then give us a 120-day notice, but it has to be for cause. And in the prior contract, it was with or without cause. That's a big change. Um, we've also increased the insurance limits. We had the insurance group go through it, and uh, they've upped the limits based on the current economies. Um, the contracts themselves, the pricing on the bids were basically 3% per year. So year two and year three in these contracts will only be increasing by 3%. I think that's a deal, knowing what's going on with inflation right now. Uh, if we can lock in a 3% increase for the next two years, um, I think it's good. And we had a, a long discussion about right of offset. What happens in a lot of contracts, and you may, may remember this from uh, the Mainscape contract, at the end of the, when we tried to get out of the contract, we would have had to sue them to retain monies that they owed us. With the right of offset, we can withhold on their final payment any warranty issues, that type of thing, in a new contract. It really ex we don't have to sue if there's a termination. We can say, well, your check is supposed to be for $300,000. We're deducting $40,000 worth of warranty claim, and then send them a, a net check for the uh, balance of uh, $260,000, which is favorable for us. 
Um, we included fire ant control. Uh, in discussion, Ryan Rourke, uh, we, in, with him, we determined that uh, we, they, there's a way that they can put down fire ant control with their normal fertilization applications. And so we said, yes, for sure, include that in the contract. Uh, we also included uh, a, a zoysia as an additional warning, uh, as an additional grass option for people. Depending on the conditions in your community, you may have situations where zoysia is a viable option for grass growth. Uh, St. Augustine certainly is a good choice, but there are some areas where zoysia uh, may be the best option. Uh, it's very resistant to weed control, and if, if actually if we started using it, it really has a strong root system and is a good option, which we'll, we'll talk to some of this in a workshop, but uh, we've added that as a, another option. Uh, we've also asked each of the contractors, we have a clause that says too wet or too dry in the contract. They're there to determine that and give it to everybody. Uh, in this contract, we've said that's not good enough. We want, we want you to have a meter. Each one of you have the same meter. It's about $300 a piece and they're gonna meter, take meter readings of areas they think are too wet, too dry, they're gonna document it, send it to Ryan Rourke, and, then, and I think in instances they'll also send it to the master to document too wet, too dry. So we have a specific, accurate, and consistent measurement of too wet, too dry. Uh, they're also gonna do increased soil sampling, uh, testing for uh, any diseases, that type of thing, but it's documented in the contract as to the, the timing and how many times they have to do it quarterly. Uh, there's also a 15 feet, they're gonna trim everything under 15 feet, so you don't have to worry about it. If it's 15 feet, they trim. In the past, there was exceptions to that, but right now, everything is trimmed in the new contract. Um, next bullet point. Uh, the enhanced grading criteria over the course of the last six months or so, the Federation, First Service, uh, established new grading criteria. It's basically statistically orientated, and it gives a much more accurate, detailed performance of how the contractor is doing monthly. Um, if they miss a trim or they miss the mow, we spot it. Ryan's out on the road every day uh, looking for to make sure that they do 100% of what we want them to do, what we're paying them for. If they don't do it, it's immediately brought to their attention. And if, in fact, uh, they fail this in the new contract, they get a non-refundable 15% deduction. Please, telephone. Uh, in the last contract, there was a 10% deduction if they failed, and they were also given a cure period. This time, if they fail, it's a 15% deduction. They don't get it back. Uh, the good thing is, is with our weekly reporting, they know that they're failing right when that week. So if they see that they're failing at the beginning of the month, they have the opportunity to fix it. If they don't, they'll see themselves lose 15%. So that's also in our favor. Um, Dave, Dave, before you go on to go back to the methodology, Yep. Uh, in the past, just so the membership knows, they used to be graded on a monthly basis. Uh, we have changed, which is the Federation's right to do, we have changed it to a weekly grading. So they are graded on a week, and uh, Keith mentioned it earlier that Ryan grades them, every single association, uh, for the first three weeks of the month, an OLM comes in and grades uh, for the fourth week, and that is how their grading score is developed. Uh, so we don't only look at what they're doing on a once a month basis, we look at what they're doing on a weekly basis. So if they're not doing something on a weekly basis, uh, they get scored against it. So. It isn't that they can go and make up that they didn't mow last week, but they mowed the week before OLM came or the monthly grade was done. Uh, basically, they can't do that anymore. If they don't mow, they get graded for not mowing. Well, couple that with the fact that we have, uh, we want their manager walking the property every week. We don't want to babysit them, but at the same time, we're gonna make sure they're doing their job. 
So with the manager out in the field looking at his own contractors, are they doing the job, plus Ryan out on the street the other t days of the week, uh, hopefully we're going to get better coverage as far as 100% uh, maintenance of our property. Um, for, for the newer people, these are our four sections. Section one is the yellow, and uh, I think this is supposed to be blue here, section two. Uh, the greenish section is section three, and section four is the reddish color. Those are the four sections that are up for bid. And Keith, if you wouldn't mind, could I go to those two charts I added at the end? Pressure's on. It's not? Okay. Uh, let, what, let's finish this. Can you capture those later here? Okay. We have the selection that we have for... Uh, have made, and we'll go through the uh, rationale on this, is section one is down to earth, section two is artistry, section three is bright view, and section four is Russell landscape. At this point, I was going to show you the rationale of why we picked that, which is critical for your understanding. Uh, Keith should be able to get us that screenshot, and we'll go through the logic and why we did that. And I'm going to tell you right now, I've already heard some people are not real happy with us losing Russell or using DTE. Um, the, the, the committee itself was under, we were not happy with the decisions we had to make, but we think we made the decision for the best of the community. Uh, it, number one is making sure we have good, good contractors in here. And the other thing is, what's the least expensive option for us? And those are the criteria that we had to look for. Um, Keith, do you want to do your slide? I'll just do the two, and if you guys can work on that. So everybody, this is the, uh, the selection um, from the landscape committees uh, per section um, that was decided, again, this was sent out to everybody in, in the package that down to earth was selected for section one, artistry was selected for section two, Brightview was select selected for section three, and Russell was selected for section four, and you can kind of see uh, their three total first year, uh, sorry, the total three year contract for each of those sections. As Dave alluded to in the beginning, that's that almost $12 million number. So, and just to kind of show you that the cost comparisons, because it will affect everybody's budgets um, in, a, in a positive way this year. Uh, but the current budget with the contracts ending March 31st of 2022, uh, cumulative for the month for all sections, you pay about $300,000. Uh, the proposed budget that was in everybody's packages that went out uh, has, is, was proposing a $345,000 per month cumulative cost for the landscaping. And then the, uh, the actual selection range that we just showed you comes in about $318,000 per month for all four sections. So again, that... Uh, Budget actual savings comes up to about $26,000 per month or about $321,000 per year. And we kind of just, again, broke it down on a, uh, a per unit per month basis of a savings of about $4.85. Again, everything is, is uh, calculated out in acreage per association, so we just tried to do a generalized number on the actual savings for in the, inside the budgets. So it is, so it is uh, w was obviously challenging with a lot of changes in the contracts, adding fire and control, uh, taking out fertilization, things like that, to really to come up with a good budgeted number, especially with inflation, 
um, and labor costs. We were hearing out from the landscapers that the $340,000 was a targeted number that we were expecting. And based on various scenarios that the committee ran, uh, you know, on plugging in each vendor in each section, we ran into several scenarios that blew over that number um, of $345,000. So um, I think you guys have three, uh, three landscapers that have been here and know the properties. I know there's some switching going around, but there's a lot of big factors that the committee took on this. And, uh, and obviously pricing has a big impact on that. The last minute IT requests. <laughs> So Dave, I think they've got it. We can pop you back up here on the last two slides to go over the, the matrix. The last two. Yeah, the last seven What's that? Round up? Yeah, that's it. Making it happen, look at that. Uh, this slide is basically what we call the extras sheet at the back of your contracts. They weren't included in the package we sent you because they need additional work. Upon approval of the contract, we will go back to the uh, various landscaper and ask them to identify some issues that we see here. Um, the item number is basically the category that the cost is. Um, I just left the number on there. Uh, I didn't. I'd still be typing if I had to put all the stuff in there. But uh, we will get back to you uh, with, if, if approved, uh, what the question marks are here. I, we don't understand some of this. We would like it clarified. But please understand that each one of the uh, contractors have submitted this uh, supplemental pricing sheet. Uh, the key that I want to mention here is even though they give you a supplemental pricing sheet, it's typically best practices to get quotes from two or three other vendors. Um, they may be the best competitive situation, or you may get a better deal from somebody else. I know some people religiously use uh, Russell, um, and probably some of the other people use some of the other contractors, but you have every right to go to Russell and try to negotiate a better deal than the pricing on here, or you can go to outside vendors and in fact, ask them for pricing. And you know, it's, it's a, if you wanna do the best, you have to look around. But these are the recommended ones that are coming from the contractor. So we, we do have that data and it will be available. Uh, the next slide, please. Oh, I only really wanted the very top slide up here, but we'll, I'd like to go through this with you. Across the top, you see section one, section two, section three, and section four and you see the bids by our five contractors. I want to go th directly to the, you see where we have blanks in there? That means that Artistry and Buccaneer did not bid on those sections. We have three bids on two sections, okay, which limits our ability to manipulate. Uh, look at section three in particular. Uh, Russell came in at $3.5 million. This is a total of three years. DTE came in at 3.2 million, and Brightview came in at 2.8 million. So Russell is my contractor in that area. I live in section three, but we have a problem. They're excessively overbid by, or underbid by two other vendors. The landscape committee looked through this, and with tears in our eyes, we said, this, we can't let Russell have this section. So we went with low bid, we went with Brightview. $2.8 million. It saved us $685,000. Okay, why? I don't know. Okay, okay, let's look at section one now. Since Brightview has section three, they are no longer part of the, of, of the of review. They, they, the only two we have now for section one is DTE and Russell. Again, DTE is the low bid, so DTE gets section one. Okay, now on process of elimination, if you go to section two, the low bid in section two is artistry because you have to eliminate DTE and Brightview. And section four, the low bid in there is Russell. <coughs> so that's how we came up with it. 
we're not happy that we're losing the vendor that we've had that's done a good job, and I'm sure a lot of people aren't happy with it either for their areas. But the question I throw to you is, if you're able to meet and be real friendly people, is it worth a half a million dollars? <laughs> okay, and that's the dilemma we had, and that's how we went through the rationale on picking our contractors. Yes? Dave, I want to I want to add something because the, the Federation Board approved uh, the Landscape Committee's recommendation as it stands. Uh, understand that it's a unique thing that there are a number of board members, like three or four of the board members reside in Section 3. Uh, we had to look at it from a financial responsibility to the community and not on a personal level uh, you have Barb Save, who is in Section 3. You have myself, who is in Section 3. You have Janice, who is in Section 3. We ha basically had a look and go, we're going to lose the vendor that we've dealt with for the last three years, but from a financial perspective, what is best for the community on a physical level? And I know that Keith spent a great amount of time running scenarios and cost, uh, depending upon how you selected them, this 345,000 that he had projected uh, would have been a lot higher depending upon who you placed where. So we had to look. But the one thing that we know is three of the four vendors that we are selecting and that the board recommended be taken to the membership from the Landscape Committee is we are familiar with three of those four vendors. We know their work. Uh, when they leave, when Brightfield leaves Section 1, I'm quite sure if we have a problem in Section 1 for something they didn't do, uh, they're just sitting in Section 3. We can go over to them. They're still here. The same thing with Russell and the same thing with uh, DTE, which gives us the capability of leveraging that they're still in the community and they still have the capability of remedying anything that was not done that was left behind. Uh, I want to add that this process started in July, I think, if I'm not uh, mistaken, Dave. Pretty close. Uh, this was not a uh, let's just throw something together and present it to the membership. Uh, every single member of the Landscape Committee, uh, including Dave and Dell and Frank and Jim, they attend the monthly meetings with these vendors. They question these vendors on the work they do. They see what is done. They're out in the field uh, along with Ryan and talking to Ryan. They have educated themselves tremendously on lawn and landscaping procedures and process and what the community really looks for. I cannot thank the entire committee, uh, Dave stepping up and, and, and remaining as chair, but the remaining members of the committee continuing to operate on this. I was joking with Dave because I walked over from the parking lot with him and I said, aren't you glad you may not have to do this for another three years? And he said, you know, basically, if I'm still the, if I'm still around, but hopefully once we get this done. Uh, I didn't say that. You probably looked at my eyes. So. <laughs> <laughs> Dave's eyes kind of glassed over. Uh, the landscapers we have, whether it's Section 1 with Brightview or Section uh, 2 with DTE or Section 4 with DTE or S Section 3 with Russell, We've all become accustomed to them. We all become uh, agreeable working with them. But we can tell you that they are uh, exceptional companies to work with. They have stepped up when we have raised issues to them. So we're not basically concerned of which company is doing which section. We're more concerned with the cost and the quality of work they've been doing. And Dell gave uh, the members, what their scores were for the month of December. Uh, so I know it may be, just as Dave mentioned, it may be disappointing to some people that their landscape vendor is going to change, 
But I really believe, and I know the Federation Board in its entirety believes that we will have good lawn and landscape vendors uh, doing the work within the community uh, going forward. Could I have a motion to approve the contract and the landscape committees? Thank you, Dan, and I take it to Drew's a second. Thank you. Any discussion? Steve Miller, Radisson One. Why wasn't uh, any of the presidents or POCs in the associations asked for any input before this was decided? And why did we limit each one of them to just one section? Why couldn't we have a vendor that did more than one section? In the preparation for the contract, and I'll ask part of it, David, in the preparation of the land, Lawn and Landscape Committee back in 2018, it was the community's uh, decision uh, after Mainscape departed to break the community into four sections and to allow one vendor per section. So there was supposed to be four uh, due to one of the vendors uh, abruptly leaving the community. One of the landscapers stepped up and said, I will honor my contract quote I gave to you if you'll give me the section. And it's basically why DTE picked up two and four. I can tell you that it was not always the optimal to have one vendor handling two different sections, uh, especially when they have to have separate crews because we look at those as separate contracts. Uh, Basically, we're just following what back in 2018 the membership asked to break it down and only allow one vendor per section. Uh, Dave, if you want to answer the second part of his question. What was the second part of your question? He was wanting to know why the presidents were not consulted on the decision that was made by vendor. Um, I can talk to the contract. Uh, in October, we sent out contracts uh, to be reviewed by each of the presidents. We did get some feedback on the contracts back, which some of which we incorporated in the changes. Um, as far as uh, the selection criteria uh, for the vendors, uh, we didn't put that out to the presidents, uh, but basically you see what our appraisal was. Doug Friedel, Tremont, two. I want to thank you for the outstanding job you guys have done. Unbelievable. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, concerns? Let's vote. I'm going to I'm going to ask you folks a question. Is there Anybody who would in, who is in attendance of the meeting vote now? Pardon? I I'm I, I'm I'm just wondering. Anybody who does not submit a proxy is in attendance. Is anybody going to vote no? Because I would like to. Wait, one more question. Come on. Uh, Elsa Mandela, Knowles Two. I apologize. This is my first meeting. I'm just elected president. This is all new to me, and thank you for explaining everything so clearly. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned something about the budget. We were saving. What's PUP? Is that per unit per monthly? Yes. And that that was four dollars and eighty-five cents. And when you be, and is. is Probably 50% of the associations have already approved their budget. Any overage goes into your account and stays in your account. So when you've approved your budget, that money will stay there. If you want to use it for something else, you can, or otherwise it'll be used in next year's budget. So the 485 goes back to every association? It stays within your account, yes. Please explain. Thank you. 
Oh, okay, and Keith, I, I, cor correct me if I'm wrong, but the price that he has, the 485, that's per unit. But when he goes and allocates the actual expense, he does it on acreage. So it depends on how much acreage your association has. So you're going to get a different allocation, but that's for reference purposes, saying you are going to get stack, it, it, but it's going to vary depending on how much acreage you have. Okay. Seeing there is no objection from the floor to the contract, the, I will ask, uh, there is one no vote by proxy, correct? Fairfield H. Yep. Which is Fairfield H, so I will ask, except for Fairfield. I will ask then by the members in present by voice vote for approval of the contract because there's only one no vote by proxy. Everyone, no no. Okay. Everyone is a yes. <laughs> Therefore, because there's only one no vote and we have unanimously consented to the uh, contract we will not do a roll call vote the day is getting late and we'll take your time and ma bell will calculate uh that one no vote out of the total and with that i will uh thank you folks for approval and your nice comments to the landscape committee uh believe me uh they represent the community and they have done a fantastic job Uh, given that, we will move to any uh, announcements for good and welfare. Yes, Dan. I will never turn Dan down from answering a question, but you guys can beat him up so that we can't leave. Dan Page, treasurer of Andover D. I'm in my seventh term as treasurer. Uh, I negotiate all of the contracts. Frequently, I cannot hire people because they say Kings Point takes too long to pay them. So I've taken upon myself to use my personal checking account to pay bills up to $1,200 when they would not do the work here. This was to get the best price. Now I'm told that everything has to go through first service. Shouldn't have turned that one off. Uh, yes, if there's contractors are having a problem with payment or being set up, we have several ways for them to get paid very fast. But if you're approving something on the spot, uh, that's obviously there, there's going to be some kind of delay. Everybody here is an association; they're their own business. You're a not-for-profit, and when you pay it as a board member out of your personal check and you pay a vendor, and now you're getting reimbursed from association funds. You know, there's a lot of tax implications there. If somebody's looking at, well, did that vendor pay taxes on that uh, on that fee? It just gets very complicated. And for a not-for-profit organization, it's best to run it through, you know, a, a proper process, get paid via the association funds. And we have several associations that we try to work on and talk to, saying, hey, don't pay, you know, five, six thousand dollars for something off of your own checkbook and then you just turn it into us without even letting us know. So the earlier you have a project that's planned or you know you're gonna do something that requires a deposit, let your CAM know, let us know, and we'll get the deposit check ready. And we can also get the final payment ready. And it works the same way when we do big paint contracts or roofing contracts. All that stuff gets brought in and, and, and lined up. So if there is a problem with the vendor, I'd be happy to speak with them. I'd be happy to help them show them ways to get paid faster. But those associations that are trying to do something on the spot with somebody, it makes it very, very challenging. I think so we had a plumbing issue way back where the plumber wanted to get paid on site and, uh, and there's no, the board had no way of saying, I'm not gonna pay with the credit card. And we had to go through that conversation with the vendor. There is the capability of vendors submitting their invoices directly into Avid, right. which would speed up the process because then it's just approval by the board representative to approve that invoice in AVID. 
Uh, and Dan, I don't know if you use Avid, but it no, is. No, I don't know how to use If you that. used Avid, you would find the vendor can submit that invoice and you get directly approval. And the minute you approve it, it goes to uh, the payment status for the check to be drawn. No, I've, I've not used Avid, so I don't know how to use that. And, and I would suggest you meet with, with, with uh, First Service, and, and I would suggest to anybody uh, uh, who's taken over as treasurer or part of it, use Avid for your payment system. Uh, when you use Avid, you can go back and look at all the history of invoices you've paid, who you've paid. It's all in Avid, it's all available to you. And it is probably the fastest way to get something paid. Because when you submit an invoice to First Service, First Service ends up entering it in Avid themselves uh, and then sending it out to you where they have set up and a lot of our vendors submit invoices directly into Avid themselves. And then it goes to your association for approval. And that takes like a, uh, 24 to 48 hours maximum, am I correct, Keith? Yeah, we can set up the vendors pretty quickly. It's just, I mean, if you have an emergency and there's something going on and you have to pay somebody on the spot, I can, we can un kind of understand that. But if there's a routine project and stuff where it's continual, we need to get you know, conversations going. It's not our goal to block a small vendors. I've dealt with a lot of them over the years. It's not our goal to, to make it difficult for them to collect their money. So we'll work with everybody and try to make it as fast as possible. We have an incident with if uh, the president contacted Keith about this. We have a, a tree that was cut down. The, tr the trunk causes flooding in the next unit. And I went online, looked up people to uh, remove the stump. And they said, we'll get back to you. None of them got back to me. A couple said they were gonna show up. The president is home. He lives next door to that. So in, in about a week ago, I finally found a company that's willing to do this. Okay. But I must have had eight or 10 different places. They all say no. They, oh, I'll be there, but no one shows up. You need a, you need a trunk remove? A tree stump. A tree stump? And we can get brown tree take stumps and stuff. No, all they the won't. I called Brian. Can can I ask oh. you? Can you take this up directly with Keith because yeah. it isn't, the federation can't work on that because of association issue? Yeah. Uh, any other comments, concerns? Seeing none, I will. You have a question. You're going to have to come up front. Preston True, Lancaster One. Uh, Jack, you mentioned we have to call the county if they don't pick up our trash. Do you have a number to call in the county? Keith can see that sent out, uh, okay. and Keith will send it out for you, okay? Any other questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. All in favor say aye. Meeting is adjourned.